my name's Diana, and I am from Adormi. Adormi is an online lingerie retailer for women. We sell everything from lacy, beautiful bras to the comfiest of sleepwear. And data is a big part of what we do at Adormi every day. Everything is facts and solid numbers with creative touches from our design team, and even that is backed by more numbers. Data is part of our culture. But how did that come to be? Now, user adoption is not something that we have a recipe set in stone for. The truth is, for each and every one of you here, you may have your own scenarios with your own specific pain points and limitations. So that's why today I'm going to walk you through the problems that we faced at Adormi and how we solved them in hopes that you're going to get inspiration on how to achieve that on your own model. So to do that, I'm going to give you a bit of context on where we come from. As most people here, we started from a breadline model. Now, we were a relatively small scale team. I was the analyst and, you know, the baker of the breadline. I wrote SQL day in and day out. When that didn't hold anymore, we thought, OK, it's time to move on to a separate reporting platform. And that's how we ended up using Looker. So let me tell you a bit about my first experience using Looker. So my lead at the time walks in one day and he's like, I got this tool, I wired it in, and in one hour you're going to be presenting it to our CRM manager. And I'm like, how can I present this? I don't even know how it works. How am I supposed to teach it to somebody else? And to my surprise, that actually went without a hitch. We actually had a productive session. You know, everything was intuitive. You clicked buttons, you had filters, everything was visual. It was great. And I thought, like, the heavens opened up to me, and I'm like, oh my god, I don't have to do manual reports ever again. Well, naive, I know. So I set that up, I put all of the models, I had all of the explorers in, and it was all just ready to welcome all of the new and eager users. Except the users weren't there. For one whole year, I struggled to get people into Looker and using the data there and keep them from relapsing into their old, outdated files and reports. And the main question buzzing around my head was just why? Why were they doing that? Why were they just going back every single time? To answer that question, I'm going to show you how our first instance looked like. Now, being the developer that I was, I set it all up to tailor my needs, like I would be using a reporting platform because obviously I was going to be like the main stakeholder for it, right? Wrong. So the first instance ended up looking something like this. Now, I'm pretty ashamed of this, and I know the people at Looker have always been nice and polite, but I'm pretty sure sh some of them cringed when I showed them this. This is not a model. This is a data dump. This is exactly what we had in the database at that time. So, but yet, at that time, I couldn't figure out for the life of me why people weren't using it. I mean, why aren't you using this amazing technology? It's like the same kind of frustration that you get when you're trying to teach your grandma to use Facebook. This can work against you in a number of ways. The first of all is it's bad UX. If you see something like this and you have to scroll through it, you've already lost the interest of more than half of your users. For those that keep going through it, you notice that everything is visible and it shouldn't be. Like, what is all this stuff? What is customer addresses or colors? What do I even need? How do I click? They just wanted a big red button that said revenue. They didn't sign up for any of this. Now, inside of it, we made another critical mistake. We used the auto loader to populate most of our views. That meant that just every single field just got tossed out there. So when you search for an order ID, it would pop up in several different places. And the amount of times that I've had to explain to people that, hey, you're not getting the right data because you're not using it from the wrong table. So that was a bit of a red flag for me. Next, you have to keep in mind that there is still a learning curve as with any technological tool. Now, also, the most important part that you're going to deal with is the fact that people aren't going to trust it. So <clears throat> for us, we had the same amount of data powering the old systems and the new ones, but none of this had ever been 
visible to our users beforehand. So naturally, it was all new, and they didn't trust it. So how did we go about solving these problems? One essential point that you have to keep in mind is that you don't need to use Looker, but your users do. Now, you can use it before, because it's convenient and then it saves you time, but they don't have any other choice than to pester you for this data. So when you're building your model, you always have to keep in mind that your users are gonna be the main stakeholders for this. Something that seems stupid and silly to you can save them hours of work and frustration. So one of the first things that you can do is to declutter. So we started with this view, okay? So we had a lot of tables and none of them were really useful. I mean, what are the chances that you're gonna use a separate data table that isn't connected to anything without any context of its own? It's, it's pretty much useless. Then we cut down on a lot of it and we added categories. Everything was a bit more structured, but we still left a lot of tables, you know, just in case somebody would need them. But then as, as we piled up more experience, we realized that, hey, we don't need those, those tables either. So we got something small and cute like we have on the right there. The second step we did was to reduce redundancy. Now, remember what I showed you before that an order ID just popped up in several places? That's a lot of decision that the end user has to make and they shouldn't be. So we went all through the instance and we removed all of the duplicates all the duplicate columns that existed throughout the instance. So that was a few dozen or so decisions less that the end user had to make. They didn't have to make a choice at all if they wanted, for example, an order ID or a customer ID. Okay, now that you have a cleaned up model, you know, you have uh, clear views in place, how do you get people to actually use it from a technological point of view? Because you know, it's, it, it's a new tool, it's, it's gonna be hard for users. So initially for me, this was a bit of a no-brainer. Like, I'm just like, go in there, you know, click on the thing, break the other thing, if I can do it, so I can do it, right? Well, that didn't exactly work. Next I thought, okay, I don't have time for this, so I sent them all to uh, the Looker business user trainings. I thought, okay, that solves my issue. That didn't either, I was still left with confused users that didn't know how to use Looker and they weren't using the data that was centralized and clean and it was all just at the very same step that I started from. It wasn't until we got the first batch of new hires that I realized what exactly I was doing wrong because these were people that knew nothing about our data, they knew nothing about our company, so naturally we had to onboard them. Whenever somebody got a new account in Looker, they would schedule half an hour to an hour with me, and I would just walk them th through the process. I would show them how to get information, where to get it from, how to use the data that was there. And suddenly the technological bit wasn't a problem anymore. Like, it, it wasn't a problem of using Looker, but it was a problem of them learning how to navigate through the data, because that was something that they were learning for the first time. They, before, they only had to think about some data that they wanted, and somebody would get, them f get it for them. But now they actually had to do all of that logic inside of their heads. They have to know how, phew, sorry. They had to know how to filter it. They had to actually know the data that they were working on. And that was an important step for me to realize what I needed to do next. So how I solved this was I built my own training program. I took the learnings from the one-on-one -on -one sessions that worked, I took content from the business user training, and then applied them to information that my users were already familiar to. I put them in the room and I taught them, okay, this is how you calculate revenue, this is how you track a promotion, this is how you calculate a CPA. Things that they were familiar with. Which leads me to my next important point is that teach people how to answer questions and the tech part will come naturally. So this all helped me uh, achieve a great success in training. I mean, I got full rooms every time and I was honestly not expecting people to still have the patience to learn. But it turns out that when I applied cases that they already knew about, they already have that in their heads. They just needed a small connector. So 
analogies rule when you're trying to teach somebody into a new tool. And this brings us to the last and possibly the most important point that you have to deal with is how you build the data trust. So I'm not gonna lie about it. This is something that you'll have to do a lot in the beginning if you're migrating into something like this. I know we had a lot to do with it, but uh, people are going to come to you and they're going to say, source A data doesn't match source B data, and then they'll look at you and ask, why? Now, this can be a very frustrating why, especially when it comes like after 10 times of them asking why, but this is a good thing. I know there's gonna come a moment of frustration and you're gonna be like, oh God damn it, stop asking me, just go use the new one. But this is an important step. If you get to this part, that means your users are there and asking questions. Now questions are good. They can uncover problems that you didn't even know that you had. They, they can think of scenarios that you, as a developer, would never actually use in real life. This is all new. And this gives you a chance to make your instance even better. And the fact that they're out there and asking these questions, it means that they want to use it. They want to make it work. But they need your help, so they can't do it alone. So the next point that I'm going to make is that trust in data starts with trust in you. So I know it's gonna sound a bit counterintuitive to what most of us are used to doing, but when you're solving problems and trying to get uh, user adoption in place, include the users in your process, include them in your investigations, explain the problems that you had. Now I know most of us as developers, we're used to hiding those issues because, well, we're people, we all do that, but it's particularly that openness and vulnerability that is going to get them to trust you. And if they trust you with the process, they will trust you with the solution. So build data trust with people trust and build something that you can enjoy together both as developers and end users and make this whole glorious instance harmony that we all dream about making with data. <laughs>